Thank you very much. Can I just ask, are there any nephrologists in the audience, apart from the two that I know? No, good, okay, few. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are the objectives of the talk um, this afternoon. Firstly, I just want to give a little overview about what happens to the kidney in pregnancy. It's quite remarkable. It really is a cure for chronic kidney disease. You get this massive increase in, in glomerular filtration. The kidney gets bigger. You get a bit of hydronephrosis. That's perfectly normal, and we can, can just ignore that. Um, but one thing that we really struggle with at the moment is to understand what the changes are in serum creatinine. We can't use any of these fangled, newfangled equations because they're, A, they aren't validated in pregnancy, and B, they just don't work in when, we, when we have actually looked in more detail. So the only way that we can ac accurately understand someone's previous kidney function is to look at their um, creatinine before pregnancy, and then we've just got to track their creatinine during the pregnancy. Um, to try and understand what the t what's happening in terms of being able to identify someone with previous disease or to detect an acute kidney injury. And the thing that I really want to just highlight is that we've got a big problem in detecting change in creatinine because often we don't know what the creatinine was when the woman became pregnant. Suddenly we've got this sort of... of a, creatinine in the middle range somewhere she could have had a creatinine of 20 and now it's 60 and that really is quite a substantial change but you might just ignore it because it's not highlighted in red on your your reporting system um, I think the thing that just to show that the, the creatinine may start to increase towards the end of the pregnancy but it's not going to go off astronomically so it really is important to do serial creatinines in order to detect a acute kidney injury now um, Anita Banerjee has uh, developed this obstetric acute kidney injury care bundle which basically is a stepwise process of diagnosing and treating acute kidney injury in pregnancy and really the thing of emphasis what I want to say is that acute kidney injury is not very common in pregnancy but it's going to be more um, that the, the causes of acute kidney injury in pregnancy are going to be the bog standard things that we usually see as nephrologists um, the nephrologist is going to come to the labour ward or to the antenatal ward really excited because acute kidney injury it's going to be atypical HUS but it's really not um, and it's really important for everybody to remember to focus on these less interesting causes of acute kidney injury which are usually precipitated by poor perfusion of, of the, the renal vessels um, the most common cause of acute kidney injury in pregnancy with the TMA, which is what we're talking about today, and Lucy has already very strongly alluded to, are going to be, is going to be preeclampsia or HELP syndrome. We've touched a little bit up, up, upon TTP um, in a renal context by, um, from Professor Scully, and, and I'm going to focus in more detail on this rare, rare situation of atypical HUS in pregnancy. And I think we've already captured the challenge that we have in terms of diagnosing these various conditions. And we've already uh, discussed the, the fact that there's likely to be some overlap, but it's important to get it right, and it's important to get it right quickly. Um, I, when I first saw this slide, I really liked it because it sort of laid out all the differences in uh, what the potential causes could be of acute kidney injury in pregnancy. But if you're at 32 weeks, pretty much you could have almost anything. So it doesn't really point you in any direction. But one thing that is interesting is that uh, atypical HUS, or Complement Alternative Pathway Dis Dysregulation, TMA, as it's now currently called, tends to occur a little bit later in pregnancy. Um, so just... Continuing with the focus of acute kidney injury in pregnancy, it is rare to end up with really bad acute kidney injury in pregnancy. Um, and that is a type of acute kidney injury that we're more likely to see with an atypical HUS picture. Um, this is a series of um, uh, coding data that was analyzed from Ontario in Canada. And the number of women who ended up on dialysis in pregnancy was one in 10,000. So if you think about your common, uh, your normal sized hospital with about 5,000 deliveries per year, you're only going they end up with one woman every two years on dialysis. Um, I'm not uh, uh, suggesting that it's not important because obviously it's associated with substantial maternal mortality, certainly fetal mortality as well, um, and some of these women don't recover, so it's important to, to uh, take very seriously. Um, but it's interesting looking at this cohort comparing women who ended up on dialysis with those that didn't, and actually none of the women who ended up on dialysis had previously had a thrombotic microangiopathy. But of those who ended up on dialysis 
who developed a thrombotic microangiopathy, it was more common than you would anticipate, and 13% of these women on dialysis had a TMA, um, 21% had preeclampsia. So again, demonstrating that preeclampsia is more common, but actually if you're getting more severe renal injury, it's becoming increasingly likely that it's going to be another cause as well that we need to think about. Um, so we've talked about doing a renal biopsy in pregnancy, and it's something that makes me shudder, in all honesty. You've got a, an organ that has now got 80% increase in blood flow. Yes, it's a bit bigger, so it might be a bit easier to spear, but it's um, quite challenging. And to get a nephrologist to do a, a kidney biopsy, the best of times in someone with platelets that are sinking is uh, a little bit uh, of a challenge. Um, so we, we're so still stuck with this classic triad that's associated historically with the diagnosis of atypical HUS. Um, we know that uh, patients who've presented with atypical HUS, it can be a chronic relapsing entity, and we now have a lot more information, and thankfully, David Cavana is here, and he's going to explain in more detail about the complement biology um, underlying uh, atypical HUS. Um, but historically, it was a really catastrophic disease. People died, and people ended up with end-stage renal failure, um, and so it really is actually a revolution that times are changing for this condition because we've got better understanding of the pathophysiology, but we also have some treatments available, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, if you go to uh, a nephrology conference these days, you'll find a massive contrast in terms of the attendance in the atypical HUS talks. People are sitting on the floor, people are fighting over the lunch, um, in contrast to, uh, let's say, the uh, sodium channel uh, genetics talks. Um, so it's a popular subject, certainly, amongst nephrologists at the moment. Um, I think we've seen the slide already a few times this afternoon, but I think before you make a diagnosis of atypical HUS, you absolutely have to go down this list of differentials in order to exclude them. And it'd be quite embarrassing saying, oh, we've got atypical HUS, and actually this woman's had diarrhea for two weeks, and nobody's actually picked up the fact that she potentially has a different trigger that could be causing this uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. We've again looked at that complicated, horrible plus, plus, minus, minus, is it, isn't it? And I just wanted to really sort of focus on the, uh, the one of the most common contrasts that you're going to have to unpick, and it's that of HELP syndrome in atypical HUS. One's rare, one's not. Um, HELP syndrome can happen postpartum. Atypical HUS commonly happens postpartum. It's all in the LFTs, but yes, the LFTs could potentially be a little bit skew with atypical HUS as well, but less likely. But really, the message I want to get across is if it's bad, if your platelets are plummeting, if you've got horrible hemolysis, if your kidney function is going off dramatically, it's going to push you more towards a diagnosis of atypical HUS. And, and I think it's important to be vigilant because that's the one that you going to really have to act quickly in order to treat. With HELP syndrome, we've got a, um, but yes, it, it can be a very dangerous condition, but we potentially have a little bit more time, and we do have a treatment, which is removing that placenta. One thing to mention is that TTP, although characteristically we're taught that it is uh, preferentially uh, affects the um, cerebral circulation, certainly on autopsy series and on biopsy, some patients with TTP also have acute kidney injury, which just clouds the water again, and I'm sorry to introduce that uh, diagnostic conundrum again to you. Um, this is a series from uh, the French registry who have unpicked and looked more closely at their pregnancy-associated TMAs, and it's quite uh, a nice representation of the timing of diagnosis of a TTP compa compared to an, an atypical HUS, but obviously there is overlap, and that's why, in a way, we're here to try and understand how we can improve our diagnostic and, uh, skills and treatment of, of patients in this uh, more tricky uh, grey area. So, if you've got a patient who has presented with hypertension, they've got some proteinuria, they've got platelets are dropping, they've got um, a maha, what are you going to do? And I'm delighted that I now have a hot dial to my friends up in Newcastle. Um, this is a revelation for us in terms of for, for nephrology services, and certainly it helps us sleep at night knowing that we've got somebody that we can contact to discuss these complex cases. David's going to curse me, I think, for uh, advertising loudly <laughs> about your service. Um, but I have to say, uh, my experience and our experience at King's has been absolutely excellent. They, um, if, if we're, we're concerned and we need to discuss a, a patient who we're suspicious of um, having uh, this condition, uh, we, we get on the phone sooner rather than later because... 
I don't know what it's like in your hospital, but to actually uh, set the, the cogs in, in motion in terms of trying to A, make a diagnosis and B, implement treatment, be it plasma exchange, be it echolizumab, it takes a while to get things in motion in order to treat quickly. Um, on their website, they have a wonderful tick list of, of investigations that are recommended, and certainly some are absolutely fundamental in order to, to confirm the diagnosis. Um, additional tests that you can have in the pipeline whilst you're kind of trying to attempt to confirm the diagnosis. And, and one thing that's really important to think about in a bit more detail in the pregnancy setting is what's happening to the placenta. Now, I don't have the answer. I don't know what's going on in, in terms of the microcirculation in the placenta. Center. And um, as Professor Scully has already alluded to, there, there are definitely thrombotic events happening in that placenta and, and how that affects the blood flow in the placenta, how that affects the, the blood flow to the baby, I don't know. But it is important to really get the obstetricians to focus and to understand, help you understand what's happening, A, in terms of fetal viability, but also how that placental function is affecting the baby. And also that can help you in some way, hopefully, differentiate between a diagnosis of preeclampsia, it would be very, very unusual to have preeclampsia at an early gestation without any signs of placental dysfunction. Um, and again, as Lucy alluded to, potentially a placental growth factor or a soluble FLIT level ratio may in the future help us with this diagnostic conundrum, but we are going to have to have more information about how the placenta is functioning in patients who have got these other thrombotic microangiopathies. So, moving on to the alternative complement pathway, um, I have handed over to David to discuss that as your last talk of the day, and I'm sure he will keep you entertained. Um, but I just really want to focus on a small aspect of the, the pathway, which is fundamental to the uh, pathogenesis of atypical HUS, and that's the alternative complement pathway. Now, this is basically the amplification loop of the complement pathway. Complement is essential for, um, for normal pregnancy, um, but it's a critical part of the innate immune system, and it's well, well uh, preserved across species. And um, recently we've had a visiting professor over from Finland, and he described, I'm not quite sure how this experiment was done, but uh, he, he described how if you were to put a football in uh, some plasma with complement activation, it would be covered within seconds. So that gives you a sort of a, a description of the magnitude and, and the ability of the complement system to really escalate in, in times of need. Um, and so what obviously is critical if you've got this ability to augment very rapidly is to be able to switch it off. And that's one of the problems um, with patients who've got atypical HUS, that there are um, there's inappropriate inactivation, but there is also potentially an inappropriate ability to switch off this cascade. Um, so what happens as, as a part of alternative complement pathway activation is that there's a production of the C5 convertase, which ultimately results in the production of a membrane attack complex, which is, I love this uh, electron microscopy uh, slide, which shows that basically it's just puncturing the cell membrane. Um, and then there's a massive influx of fluid and it causes hemolysis. And that can happen, um, obviously, uh, in an in a, um, appropriate setting, but in a pathological setting, this is happening widespread within the endothelium, within um, red blood cells. So what do patients need in terms of uh, acquiring a, um, an atypical HUS um, syndrome? Um, we're getting more and more information about what the triggers are, what the genetic abnormalities are that uh, mean that uh, patients are predisposed, um, and certainly as um, uh, Karen has alluded to, there are abnormalities certainly with um, antiphospholipid syndrome, some complement dysregulation as well. So there's a real sort of melting pot, and I think which Beverly nicely described at the beginning, um, that, that we're really needing to start to put all these pieces together to really un unpick what is happening in the bigger picture to help us with diagnosis and treatment. But why is pregnancy a trigger for atypical HUS? And it's, it's quite remarkable if you think about um, what is going on in a normal healthy pregnancy. It's funny to think that it's actually a, a quite a, an aggressive inflammatory process. And if um, you understand that if a woman was left pregnant, everybody would develop preeclampsia at some point because um, the placenta would be unable to cope. Um, but there is activation of complement. Um, and um, really, if you can think about the, the pathway of atypical HUS being a series of multiple hits, if you like. And in pregnancy, we potentially have a susceptible individual who's got 
abnormal um, alternative pathway complement proteins, um, we get this insult of uh, additional complement activation, particularly towards the end of pregnancy. The placenta um, performs a remarkable activity in pregnancy in terms of mopping up complement act activation. Um, and if you've got a dysfunctional placenta, a diseased placenta, such as um, uh, a patient who's got preeclampsia where the placenta hasn't actually formed properly in the first place, and or the placenta is removed after delivery, that could contribute to this cascade becoming out of control. We've already talked about the angiogenic imbalance. Um, could that also be a contributing factor? And then bleeding as well. Women who have had cesarean sections, there's some signal that they may be more likely to develop, uh, but that, that, that might be a trigger for atypical HUS. Um, how that pathway contributes, we're, we're yeah, as yet unclear. Lucy's touched upon uh, and discussed beautifully the uh, angiogenic factor changes in, in pregnancy. Um, and I just want to allude to the fact that now treatments that are being used for oncology, uh, which are a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, so something that would basically act like a soluble flit, switching off um, the stimulation of the um, vascular endothelial growth factor pathway, keeping that endothelial calm, um, can lead to features of preeclampsia, if you like, protein in hypertension in non-pregnant individuals. And now a, a, a renal-specific TMA has also been described why the kidney is so susceptible to this injury, we don't know. It's obviously full of capillaries. Um, it's very metabolically active, but that, uh, why that's such a, a vulnerable organ bed, we, do, we just don't know. Obviously, one of the things to start moving in, uh, in, sim in, in um, simultaneously with your diagnostic processing is kind of teeing up potentially, is this patient going to need plasma exchange? What's going to be needed to do that? Um, certainly, the sort of hypothesis behind using plasma exchange in these situations is to remove the dysfunctional proteins. Um, but sadly, in a majority of patients who have atypical HUS, the condition is resistant to plasma exchange treatment. So now, this is the, uh, the excitement in the ne nephrology world. This is ecoluzumab, which is a new treatment that is now licensed for use for the treatment of atypical HUS in, in the US and in Europe. And it acts to inhibit C5 activation. It hangs around for a little while, but it does need redosing. It appears to stay within the vascular space. Um, and it appears to be broken down by lysosomal enzymes. Um, and how it works is it switches off that activation of the, um, the, the membrane, the formation of the membrane attack complex. Um, so the initial sort of induction phase is a treatment every week, um, and then there's an, a maintenance treatment. And it, it has remarkable uh, effects in certainly in non-pregnant patients, and David's going to discuss shortly uh, its effects in, in pregnant patients. Um, if it started sooner, it appears to be associated with better outcomes, and it appears to be associated with uh, outcomes regardless of the trigger and regardless of the genetic abnormality underlying the condition. One of the major downsides of ecoluzumab, obviously the complement system is essential for innate immunity and patients who've been treated are much more prone to develop meningococcal disease and various stipulations in terms of how we prevent against that. Um, unfortunately, one of the common side effects is also a headache, So, and, and obviously infections, unsurprisingly, are, are very common. Um, and then the funding, that is a major issue and has caused a lot of debate. Um, dialysis costs £30,000 a year if um, anybody is uh, wanting to compare. Um, and obviously another alternative would be to do a liver kidney transplant in somebody who'd reached end stage because the liver produces 90% of complement proteins. Um, but NICE have approved decaluzumab for use in atypical HUS, and there are lots of stipulations in terms of when it can be used, how it can be used, and the process of its use. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, the atypical HUS centre in Newcastle have been commissioned by NHS England to coordinate um, those, uh, the, those recommendations. What about ecoluzumab in pregnancy? I like this picture because it looks like she's just about to have a big drink of it, doesn't it? But um, uh, it's not licensed. Very few drugs are licensed in pregnancy. Um, and we are gathering gathering information about ecoluzumab for the, in the use of atypical HUS, but really at the moment our data is based on safety from the use of um, ecoluzumab in PNH. So um, I was surprised when I was uh, uh, pulling together these slides that actually how horrible PNH is in pregnancy. Look at the maternal mortality, 21% in some theories um, um, with associated fetal mortality. 
This is a study that was published two years ago, and this is a questionnaire study of, of um, interested individuals, 75 pregnancies, but there were no maternal deaths, which is quite exciting. Um, I'm not really going to focus in any more detail because I don't think it's a comparative treatment in terms of outcomes for the infants, but I think it's important to recognise the use of ecolizumab in pregnancy may need more monitoring. The plasma volume increases dramatically in pregnancy, and certainly lots of these women needed an increase in dose. That was towards the end of pregnancy. Maybe because there's more complement activity then as well, or maybe because there's more breakdown of, of the drug too. Um, interestingly, there have been some proposals because of the association with complement abnormalities in HELP syndrome, in preeclampsia, that maybe this could be the cure for preeclampsia as well. But it's interesting that some women who were actually given this drug throughout their pregnancy still developed preeclampsia. Um, what about the babies? So Unsurprisingly, it's an IgG antibody. It's very effectively transferred across the placenta, and it has been detected in the cord blood of infants. It's been detected in babies. Um, but the levels don't seem to be catastrophically high. Um, and certainly, this is one case report suggesting that the in infant activity of complement activation was appropriate despite the maternal component being switched off. Longer-term infant outcomes, I mean, we're never going to have enough information about this, and certainly the sort of longer-term outcomes about the risk of autoimmunity in the future, for example. Um, but as yet, we've got no evidence to suggest that it's teratogenic. Um, and in this series, thankfully, we got a lot of, uh, they got a lot of good follow-up data, um, and they've performed developmental assessments, and there were no concerning safety signals, certainly. Um, what about ecolizumab and breastfeeding? When I did this, um, I think it's come out very well. Yes, it has. Zero, zero when I searched it in PubMed. Um, but um, it's not likely to pass into breast milk. And when it has been tested for in breast milk, it wasn't identified. Um, and interestingly, in this series of the PNH women, actually a lot of women took, um, did, did, did breastfeed, interestingly. So finally, what about women who've already got a diagnosis of atypical HUS and they want to have a pregnancy or they've had an episode in a pregnancy and they want to have another pregnancy? How do we manage these women? And at the moment, we really don't have enough information to predict who's going to relapse, um, how likely it is that they will relapse, um, and we're gathering more information. Yes, it's definitely possible that some women will relapse, but do we treat proactively? Do we give them ecolizumab throughout the pregnancy or do we watch and wait? Um, certainly there are uh, case reports of both approaches being uh, uh, used and certainly case reports of, of women being given a uh, dose of ecolizumab just before that critical period of delivery. Um, and David and I are currently managing a, a lady who uh, is very complicated and uh, had a TMA type picture um, at 21 weeks and uh, an in uterine death and she's now pregnant again at six weeks and it's going to be a, a long journey I think. Um, but that's something that um, we can discuss later. So just to conclude, um, atypical HUS, it's really rare. It's something that we don't want to miss. Um, certainly, there's huge uh, advances in terms of our understanding of the pathogenesis now. Um, it appears to occur a little bit later in pregnancy or postpartum, maybe give you a clearer clue, um, a, a steer on, on what the diagnosis is, what the cause of a TMA is. There's increasing evidence that ecolizumab is likely to be helpful, but we need to have more safety data, certainly for the, the maternal uh, safety, but also for long-term uh, fetal and infant safety. Thank you. <laughs>